afternoon and welcome to Capital Account. I'm Lauren Lister here in Washington, D.C. These are your headlines for Wednesday, September 5th, 2012. Gold slips ahead of the ECB meeting, or so the story goes. Are these the kind of macro trends that are really driving gold prices as much as the headlines would indicate? Our guest Bill Murphy, chairman of GATA, says no. He's flown all the way to Washington to make the case. And I'm sure you remember the report last month that U.S. regulators were likely to drop their silver market manipulation probe. And then Commissioner Bart Chilton fired back that their report was premature and inaccurate. We haven't heard much since, but of course, J.P. Morgan is at the center of these manipulation claims. And our guest is forecasting that the rubber may meet the road for the big bank and its silver position possibly this month. Could it explode? We'll hear from him. Plus, are lap dances, nude lap dances, an art form worthy of tax-exempt status? Well, New York's highest court will reportedly weigh the arguments for and against, and at the end of the show, so will we. Let's get to today's Capital Account. So as I said at the top of the show, gold eased, according to media reports today, as investors were cautious ahead of the ECB meeting that begins tomorrow and the Federal Reserve's meeting next week. This is after hitting a six-month high earlier. Now, this is the latest macro trend that the movement of the precious metal is being attributed to. But does this explain it? Or... Is there market manipulation going on behind the scenes, driving moves and price suppression, despite an environment that says everything is fine? Kind of like this. Good morning, ladies. Good morning, Claire. I would like you all to welcome our newest citizen to Stepford, Joanna. Good morning, Joanna. Well, as far as the Stepford wives and the brunette in the room, the Nicole Kidman character, when it comes to gold and silver, that brunette would be Bill Murphy, our guest. He's been at it for more than 10 years, investigating and unearthing evidence of metal market manipulation. And he is here in studio all the way from Texas, I should mention, to talk about it. He's chairman of the Gold Antitrust Action Committee and author of LeMetropoleCafe.com. And I'm just so happy to have you in studio. Thank you so much for making the trip from Texas. Great to be here, Lauren. Thank you. Yeah, so let's start with some of the, the more current news, just because we recently did have that report that, that the CFTC may wind down its probe of market metal manipulation. And then Bart Shilton, the commissioner that has been quite vocal on this issue, said he thought that that was... Uh, perhaps premature and, and inaccurate. That said, when people think of metal manipulation in the silver markets, they may think of J.P. Morgan. And I was listening to some earlier interviews of you, and you think that there could be some fireworks with J.P. Morgan in regards to its silver position, possibly this month. What do you, what do you think could happen here? Well, in the, at the beginning of the summer, one of my best sources told me that gold and silver were going to take off in August, break out of their trading ranges, and go towards towards all-time highs. And part of that process would be the problem that J.P. Morgan has with their massive short position. Uh, they've been manipulating the market for a long time. It's very difficult to get silver in size. And they've been found out in terms of how they've really ripped off the little guy, the common man, with the manipulation of this market. And that should all come to uh, fruition sometime, I hope, this month, and if not this month, by next month. What will that look like, and why do you think it will happen on this time frame? Well, basically, and I've seen some stuff on the record that it's, it's exposing Morgan and what they've done. And I can't get into it, but uh, it was from that same source. Who, who is this source, Bill Murphy? <laughs> I, I do tell. It's like a, deep, <laughs> like a deep throat sort of character. Okay. Yeah. Deep throat character from one, what kind of industry? Regulatory or banking or... Well, he knows what he's JP talking about. J.P. Morgan I, itself? He knows what he's talking about, and uh, he's been around the business a long, long period of time. But basically, the silver is in a, in a big shortage if you want to get it in size. For example, if you want five, ten, fifteen million dollars worth of silver, you can't get it for weeks or for months. And then when you finally do get the silver, it's all current date minted bars, it means the silver is not around. So I would expect some sort of delivery problems coming up. 
by the end of the year, maybe even a force majeure. And I, as this people realize the shortage, and it's happening now, investment sharks are going after J.P. Morgan in their short position. And that's why the price of silver has gone up from 26 27 now to over $32 an ounce. And if I'm correct, it's on its way to 50 or 60 by the end of the year. So you think that, because you do argue that J.P. Morgan has been a silver market manipulator suppressing the price, right? So this means this, the suppression scheme is over, coming to an end well, for them? It's, they have big they have big problems with, uh, with what happened and what they've done and it's going to make it much more difficult for them to continue doing what they're doing. In addition, they're running out of physical supply. Well, and, and I want to talk more on that note, because first, uh, J.P. Morgan is widely assumed to have this uh, huge short position in the physical silver market. But when was the last time and what was last information we have that quantifies its short positions and long position and how they stack up against each other? Do we know definitely? You know, it's actually a great question, because I testified in front of the CFTC about Morgan's short position position as well as HSB, HSBC's uh, short position in gold and you could quantify it more easier with the reports they had back then. They changed the reports uh, so it makes it more difficult to identify what they're doing but from what I am told that they, they, they've cut their position down somewhat but it's still huge and they're in trouble with it and a lot of it it's complicated it has to do with the LIBOR uh, situation it has to do with the whale trade problem it has to do with the position they took over from Bear Stearns the bottom line is all this is coming together, and I would look for the price of silver to explode in the not-too-distant future. Okay, so and you think that could happen this month or next month, you're saying possibly. One thing I saw that I read that, that caught my eye was it was an investment professional in the silver space who was writing and said uh, that he had heard that last week J.P. Morgan raised the price it was willing to pay for silver to $31. Uh, this was above the, the, the price that Spot Silver was trading at last week. Why would they do that? Well, it's a good point. If you're in a position and you're short and you have to deliver to longs and you can't get the physical supply, you raise the price above what the general market would pay so you can get it. And uh, there's not desperation yet, but I, I think pretty soon you're, when you see the price acceleration, that's when you know the panic has started. So you think that's what this is about, that the shortage of supply that J.P. Morgan can't get its hands on, so they're willing to pay more for it, and that's that, what we're already seeing start. That's correct, and that's why you, someone else has given you that information. Uh, it's good to hear. That's interesting. I, I read it. I, I can't remember the gentleman's name. Silver, silver dealer. Uh, also, that same guy was writing about the LBMA exchange and, and talking about this shortage of silver and that deliveries are being delayed and that deliveries for the large orders were not available immediately. It, it sounds a little like the 1930s when banks were counting the money more slowly during bank runs as employees tried to rush in the back and, and fill up the coffers with more cash. Is that any kind of apt metaphor for what's going on now with silver? Well, it could be a perfect metaphor for the precious metals market. Think of it like a fractional reserve system. Nobody really knows in these unallocated accounts, and even some cases, like in Switzerland, Switzerland, allocated accounts, how much gold is really there and it's not encumbered by other people thinking they own the same gold. Just. Uh, I don't know, a few years ago, Morgan Stanley was fined millions of dollars for charging clients uh, for silver they were storing for them, but the silver wasn't there, and they ended up having to pay huge fines, and that could be going on, which we know is going on, all over the gold-silver world, where they're taking in all this money, selling gold to the same people, but not actually purchasing the gold, and they're using all the funds. As long as people leave gold and silver in the system, no problem. But right. a run starts, yikes. It's like musical chairs, and there are not enough chairs when everybody goes to sit down. But in the 1930s, during the Depression, there were bank failures. Is there any case where we'd see bullion banks fail? It's, I think when we get to the tipping point, that's the kind of thing will happen. People will be asking for their gold and silver. They won't get it, and that will lead to a failure of certain sorts, at least a failure within a division of a company. Okay, that's interesting. And, and it, it's also a, a little different today where you have all these much bigger enterprises, so it's a division of a big bank we're looking at, not, you know, the bank in its entirety, and there's, of course, a bailout guarantee, you could argue, for some. Looking more broadly at the big picture on that note, it certainly isn't our grandmother or grandfather's metals market anymore with ETFs and, and derivatives markets. Uh, a lot more people have been able to get in, and this arguably has affected the price of precious metals. What impact do you think ETFs? are having and have had on the market. 
Well, it's been tremendous for demand. It's an easy way for people to buy gold and silver and not have to go through all the delivery uh, mechanism and so on. But there's a difference between some of these ETFs. And yeah. again, I don't want to seem, well, I am a little prejudiced, a lot prejudiced against <laughs> Morgan and HSBC, Morgan in particular, but because they're the custodians of the two major gold and silver ETFs. That is a big question I had. So how does that factor in? Explain the role, because could you argue that that explains um, their large positions or, or their hedging positions? Does that explain some of their short positions, the fact that they are the custodians of these huge ETFs? Well, something doesn't smell right, and I testified uh, f about this in front of the CFTC a couple of years ago. HSBC is the major gold short. They're the custodian of the gold, major gold ETF. The same thing is true with Morgan and Silver. There's nothing, nothing in their prospectuses which uh, prohibits them from leasing out their gold or using it you know, for the marketplace. Oh, I see. Nobody knows. And it, I think it just smells fishy. You know, if, if I'm buying gold and silver with an ETF that actually could use it against me. It's a conflict of interest. Because you're saying that they could lease out the gold that's supposed to back the ETF that they're selling to people. Or sell or use it for whatever they want to do. Okay. But what about, the question I had on this too, could the being the custodian of the ETF explain their large short positions in the metals market because they're hedging for clients? Well, if you are a client and you're investing in gold and silver and the custodian's taking their, their investment and using it to hedge, in other words, to go against your position, okay. I would be outraged. I would okay. find that horrifying. Okay, so there's no hedging argument to be made in your view. Well, not legitimate. They may be okay. doing it, absolutely. But if you're, think of it, if you're an investor in one of these ETFs mm -hmm. and they're using your own uh, investment to go against you, I think that's a little ridiculous. Right, okay. So then when we're, when we're talking about price suppression, you mentioned JP Morgan and HSBC. Are there any other banks to be thinking about or are these the two, in your view, that are the major players? Well, you know, it's interesting. When GATA started in mm -hmm. 1999 to expose the manipulation of the gold market, there were certain banks, uh, Morgan, Chase, Deutsche Bank, Goldman Sachs, and then we realized the, the Fed was involved, the Treasury, the Exchange Stabilization Fund, Bank for National Settlements, that it was much bigger than that. But within that context, the players have changed. Goldman Sachs is no longer around. And well, I used to call them Hannibal Lecter. I mean, that's how, <laughs> that's how egregious they were back then. But they're gone. Okay. So things change. But in essence, the, the people I mentioned are uh, very much a part of it. Okay, so JP Morgan and HSBC are the big players to be and thinking gold, about. Well, they're the big shorts. Okay. That's right. Okay, and silver and gold respectively. And then this all uh, can't happen without, in terms of gold, without the Western Central Banks, in your view. And this is something that you have spoken a lot about. You've been working at this for 10 years at GATA. I want to get into all that work. We're going to go to a short break, but we will have much more when we do come back with Bill Murphy, chairman of the Gold Antitrust Action Committee. Still ahead, too. How did Bill Murphy's past as a pro football player? Prepare him to try to get Gata's message out. I'm going to ask him after the break, but first your closing market numbers. Here's Mitt Romney trying to figure out the name of that thing that we Americans call a donut. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm just a guy who cares an awful lot about my country. You, sir, are a fool. You know what? That is mine. Are there terrorist cells in your Far neighborhood? The does not want the USA to defeat terrorism. You cannot be a liberal and a Christian. Republicans lie. <laughs> it's really so stupid. <laughs> You know, the corporate media distracts us from what you and I should care about because they're a profit-driven industry that sells us sensationalistic garbage and calls it breaking news. I'm Abby Martin, and we're going to break the set. <laughs>
welcome back. We're talking today with the chairman of GATA, who is telling us uh, uh, some of the many um, investigations and findings that that he's found during the more than 10 years and he's that he's been at this, identifying uh, evidence of market manipulation in the gold and silver markets. And I just want to bring up just one example where we've kind of seen this mentioned, and this isn't a WikiLeaks cable that uh, that Bill Murphy brought to my attention. This is uh, from the U.S. Embassy. It deals with Chinese press reports, and and this is. A quote from one, the U.S. and Europe have always suppressed the rising price of gold. They intend to weaken gold's function as an international reserve currency. They don't want to see other countries turning to gold reserves instead of the U.S. dollar or the euro. Therefore, suppressing the price of gold is very beneficial for the U.S. in maintaining the U.S. dollar's role as the international reserve currency. So let's bring Bill Murphy back into the conversation because I want to talk more about kind of the highlights in, in GATA's work over the years. So just to, to peg off of that WikiLeaks cable, now that was not a classified uh, cable that was coming from Chinese press reports. What do you think is the significance of something like that being in the Chinese? Press. Well, it's very significant, Lauren. The, the biggest buyers today are the Chinese and the Russians, and the irony is the people that probably probably follow God are the most are the Chinese and the Russians. Uh, I've had three conference calls with the Chinese Investment Corporation. Uh, and as far as the Russian Russians go, uh, their central bank knows all about God. One of my favorite things to bring up is uh, the number two guy, Oleg Mozikov. Uh, years ago in front of this big bullion forum in, in, in Moscow surprised everybody and he started talking about Gata and he, he compared it to a Russian a, a poem in, about what his central bank was doing he says the giraffe is tall and he sees all and I think the Russians have followed us they've had Andrei Baikov the, the consultant to President Putin has been to two of our conferences they've been big buyers since then they are taking advantage of this artificially cheap gold and buying it up from people that are giving it away too cheaply. Interesting. So do you think that the, because you, you argue that Western central banks, that the Fed is manipulating the price of gold. So does that mean that the Fed is subsidizing the purchases of gold by the Russian and Chinese? Well, in a way, in a way <laughs> it is. In other words, if gold were to have kept pace with inflation, and pe other people say this, it would be $2,500 or more right now. Mm -hmm. And it's only now 1700 That's how much of a difference this manipulation has made. And of course, with what's going on in the world in Europe and the United States and printing money, you could say that maybe gold should be fairly priced at 3000 Okay. So they've done a, they've done a job on the, on the prices. Before I get into the, the evidence of that, uh, what price do you think gold and silver need to reach to uh, clear uh, in terms of price, I know you cited upwards of five thousand dollars an ounce before for gold. I think you told us that when we last spoke in April. Do you stand by that, or do you think it would need to be higher? I've seen some uh, estimates as high as ten thousand dollars an ounce. Well, you know, any number you know uh, you could come up with it. When right. I, we had our conference at uh, Dawson City in the Yukon, uh, August two thousand and five, price was four thirty six. I said it would take three to five thousand back then to clear the market. I think it'll be easily go there. And for silver, I think you can pick a number. If I'm correct about what's going to develop, I think we can move past 50 very quickly, uh, then get up to 80 or 90 and sit for a while and then double that in the years ahead. Okay. And then what, uh, to back up to Gata's work, you've been doing this for more than 10 years. What would you say are kind of the, the biggest smoking guns, I guess, that you found over the years of doing this of, of suppression in the metal markets? Well, you know, it's a, great, it's a great thing to bring up. It's like a murder trial. Right. You've got about 150 things, and you hear the jury's looking at all this evidence, and if you sit there and can look at it all, and it was a, you, you'd come up, the jury would say guilty beyond a reasonable, reasonable doubt, death penalty. And that's what it, that's what it all is. <laughs> you One, think? Yeah, yeah. And when you put it all together, you can come up to no other conclusion. One specific thing is Andrew McGuire, former Goldman Sachs guy, two and a half years ago at the CFTC he hearing, we got his emails that he had sent to the CFTC about what JP Morgan was going to do ahead of time, mm -hmm. and it happened over and over again, and still nothing's been done about it yet. I mean, if you that's a smoking gun. I mean, okay. you, you tell somebody what's going to do before they do it, then they do it? Yeah. Yeah, okay, that's a good example. But also you, I mean, you've, you've sued the Fed, and you have testified before regulators, and you took out a Wall Street Journal ad that you paid a couple hundred thousand dollars for. I yeah. believe, you know, go through some of these. Well, January 31st, uh, 2008, uh, we put a $264,000 full page color ad in the Wall Street Journal. In that ad, we talked about catastrophe and disaster coming as a result of the manipulation of this market. Two months later, we had this crash. And there's the ad right there. 
Uh, I'm curious, what has this done maybe to get the message out about GATA? How has the reception been in the past few years? Uh, silence. <laughs> <laughs> That's a couple hundred thousand dollars in yeah. bunch of silence. Yeah, but That's if not we, a good if, return if on investment, no, I'm just joking. As long as this goes on, it's what's what's coming is actually going to be worse than we saw in 2008. They distorted all all the markets. They don't let the markets trade freely anymore. I mean, you've got the plunge protection team and the counterparty risk management group in the stock market. Everybody knows the bond market's manipulated. Of course, we've proven in our way we see it, gold and silver manipulated. Things don't work right. And that's that's getting back to where that uh, Stepford Wives thing mm. comes in. Yeah. Everything is fine, but it's not fine. And we have a number of people that come on this shows and talk about the various way that the market is rigged and that prices are rigged. Why do you think that some of your critics have said, you know, GATA, they have conspiracy theories? Well, you got me. I mean, mm. I would say it's the not invented here syndrome for one. Two, a lot of them are working with the bullion banks. But it gets me because the kind of people we have around us, I mean, the Mr. Gold of South Africa, Peter George, Mr. Silver of Mexico, Hugo Salinas Price, Mr. Gold in the United States, Jim Sinclair, Eric Sprott, John Embry of Sprott Asset Management, uh, James Turk, Gold Money. I, mean, I could go on and on about these yeah. really smart. A lot of smart, really smart people. Really smart people and all behind us and all know that we're correct. And I just have to ask, because I don't know how many people may know this about you, Bill Murphy, but you were once a starting wide receiver for the Boston Patriots back in 1968. How did your days as a football player, without the full mask, you informed me before the show, how did that prepare you to, to fight this fight? Well, a lot of our critics you were just talking about think I got hit in the head too hard. <laughs> oh, come on. I had football back then. But it was a great experience, and uh, yeah, it was a starter, and I loved it, and uh, great memories. And you get hit there a lot, and you get back up, and you do the same thing when it comes to taking on the rich and powerful and the, this gold and silver market manipulation mess. All right. Well, Bill Murphy, thank you so much for being here and uh, banging it around with us. Thank you, Lauren. Let's wrap up with a little loose change because, as promised, I, I told you a little about this story at the top of the show. And thanks to Hollywood, even if you haven't had this experience for yourself, you probably know what comes with the job of being a stripper. Would you say an exotic dancer is an artist? Well, a nightclub in Albany said so, and because of that, they haven't paid $124,000 in taxes from the admission and what they call couch sales or lap dances. So club owners say that the dances are exempt because under state law, uh, if you have a dramatic or musical arts performance, you don't have to pay taxes on it. They say lap dances qualify. So now this is a fight. It's going to the highest court in New York, the, the Court of Appeals. Dimitri, what do you think? Do you think that that lap dances are, <laughs> are art? Do you think this should even be a debate in this terms is ridiculous. of ridiculous. They shouldn't have to pay taxes. That's absurd. Who, I mean, I think there should be some, there should be some connection between you, the, the taxes and how much the state has actually helped you to get there. I mean, what? Like the road they drove to get to the to the strip club and that what? I mean, what? It's a lab dance. She created it herself. I mean, why should she have to pay taxes on that? It's absurd. I think it's a, the height of absurdity. It's a perfect example of, of like complete overreach of taxes. I, well, you know, it makes sense to me. I mean, at first I was. In your <laughs> I see my my friends are there at the Hartman team. They're they, they, they're upset with me as I usual. I think well, I think there's one <laughs> angle of this story. I think that you know perhaps the tax collectors just really want to collect these taxes, if you know what I mean. Oh, I, I, I <laughs> so like, they really want to win this fight. That's smart. Like, they're like loan sharks. They're like, you know, if you can't pay up, yeah. We'll yeah. give you a discount, but you got to pay in your own art form. Yeah, and before we move on, I, I was kind of like, okay, just pay the taxes, strip club. But then I was looking at the process that, process that they've gone through to evaluate what constitutes the kind of art and dancing that qualifies. And the fact that bureaucrats are trying to decide, okay, well, they, they don't have to have dance training. And right. it's not, we, we, can't, we can't really discern that it is choreographed dance is just 
like get bureaucracy get out of deciding break, art. If Robert Maplethorpe can make homosexual S and M art, then these girls can too. Well, so let's I got move on. I no All right. That. Okay. So by now you've probably noticed a lot of mega churches are known for asking for donations. A little like this. and cure your backaches. You don't care what these people need. Your truck broke down and you're looking to cash in. I give my people a good show. Well, here's someone that sounds <laughs> like they're giving people a new show. The new creation megachurch in Singapore is asking God to reward attendees with jobs, cars, pay raises, if they contribute to the multi-million dollar funding drive. And uh, at the service, armed security guards watch the cash, auditors oversee the donations. Sounds like a pretty well-oiled gig to, to get this money. What do you think this represents, Dimitri? So, I mean, there's so many different things about this that are interesting. One, I think it's indicative of a bull market in Asia, mm. the psychology. I mean, that these people are like, looking for cars and consumer goods, you know, with religion. I think here people are trying to find a way to emotionally deal with this ongoing depression. But in Asia, they're more like, you know, they're looking towards the future. Every year will be better than the last. Maybe maybe that's it. But uh, the other thing is just, uh, you know, the church is, is a racket, man. It's been around since forever. And I think it's about time that they reassert themselves, all right? Mm -hmm. uh, you, you have central what? banks that... Ex I'm the church issue? <laughs> What's wrong with you? Replace one cartel with another? Make, trying to make sure if you're listening there, Lister. Yeah, I just, I piped up right then. <laughs> Look, uh, you know, whatever. I mean, what am I going to say? The uh, church is harmless. I'm Back in the... This is not harmless. Read... They're asking for money in regard... They're in, re in promising something that they cannot promise in return. I want to move on because I'll just leave our audience with this before we go. Uh, we've heard that the DNC, Obama this convention speech was supposed to be at the B of A stadium, and then some officials were calling it the Panther Stadium. And now I just read a report that maybe it won't be there after all because of rain. Here's another way to tackle the bank if you don't like it. Just burn it down like they did at Burning Man. Take a look at this video. Burning Man, sucking it to the big banks with that art exhibit that they burned to the ground. I'll leave you with that because it's all we have time for. Thank you so much for watching, though, and have a great night. And don't forget to come back tomorrow. You know, in the meantime, you can always follow me on Twitter at Lauren Lister. Give us feedback at YouTube.com slash Capital Account. Watch us in HD on Hulu and have yourself a great night.